We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag YouBelongAtACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church family. Wow, thank you all so much for uh, your appreciation. I do want to let you all know, well, first of all, we haven't had a chance to meet yet. My name is Matt. I serve here at ACC as a lead pastor, but we have an incredible pastoral team here at ACC, and all of them are certainly worth your appreciation. So can we give it up for our other pastors at ACC? Yeah. Oh, I do want to say on behalf of our entire staff, if you're a guest here with us today, with all sincerity, we're really glad that you're here. It's just a genuine, uh, heartfelt statement that we are really, it, 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 we count it an honor that you would spend a Sunday with us checking out what God's doing here. We wear these, uh, sometimes you'll see a lot of people wearing these shirts today. If you haven't got one yet uh, from yes, last week or this week, make sure to get one on your way out. But we truly believe that you belong here. You might not even quite be sure yet what you believe. You might be exploring God's word. You might be exploring this concept of the church and who Jesus says that he is. Well, we want you to know that this is a great place to come and explore those things. This, uh, you belong here with us as you explore those things. And our prayer is that just like God's done a work in many of our lives, that he'll continue to reveal himself and the truth of who he is to you and that you can explore that with us. Um, so we're really glad that you're here. Make sure to introduce yourself at some point today, maybe at the party at the parking lot. I would love to meet you. Um, but hey, we're starting a brand new series today called Worlds Apart. And what, what we're really doing is looking at the fact that there's a lot of people in this world that view the world very differently. They have many different belief systems and value systems and all those things. One story that comes to my mind is the story of uh, four blind men that, are, uh, uh, that come upon an elephant and they've never experienced an elephant before. They don't know what, quite what they've stumbled upon. So the first one steps forward and where he's standing and he reaches out and he, he feels the trunk of the elephant and he feels it and he's trying to figure out what it is that he's touching. And the next guy goes up and he, he kind of feels the, the, the leg of the elephant. He wraps his arms around it and he gets a, an idea of what he must have stumbled upon. And the next guy walks up and he kind of bumps into the, the side of the elephant. He feels a solid, sturdy uh, thing. And the next guy comes up and he feels the tail. And then the guys all kind of huddle back and they're like, well, at least we now know what it is. And the guy says, yeah, we've, we've stumbled upon a really big snake. And the next guy's like, what are you talking about? It wasn't a snake. It's a tree trunk. And the third guy says, it's not a tree trunk. It's clearly a wall. And the fourth guy says, no, it's a rope. And they, they argue amongst themselves about what it is that they've stumbled upon. But what have they actually stumbled upon? An elephant. It right? doesn't matter if they think it's a snake or a tree trunk or a wall or a rope. The absolute truth of the matter is they've stumbled upon an elephant. And the same thing is true for each of us. We all view the world in different ways. We all have a unique perspective. We've all experienced different things, seen different things, been raised in different homes. And from those unique experiences, we all view the world from different areas and different places. In fact, for many of us, the way you view the world, it's worlds apart from how someone you know may view the world. And everybody has one of these things called a worldview. So today, we're going to look at simply a biblical worldview, not just today, but over this entire series, we're going to look at how a biblical worldview compares to other worldviews that you'll encounter throughout this world. Uh, and, and specifically, to get started with this, I think a good place to start is understanding what this word worldview even means. I'll give you a really quick definition of the word worldview. A worldview is simply how we understand the world in which we live. Or more simply put, you're going to love this, your worldview is the way you view 
the world, right? It's just simply the way you view the world. And you view the world one way, and someone else might view the world another way. We all have different worldviews. In fact, you might not even realize you have a worldview, but you do. And worldviews are like belly buttons, okay? Everyone's got one. I had an, uh, heard another pastor this week say a worldview is like a cerebellum. And some of you are like, what's a cerebellum? Well, it's a part of your brain. You might not even realize you have a cerebellum, but you do. Everyone's got one. And the point is that everyone has a worldview, even if you don't realize you have a worldview, you do, because all of us view the world a certain way. We might not have ever asked ourselves, what worldview do I have, or how do I answer these questions? But the truth is, we all answer certain questions a certain way. We all have one. You know, when you're trying to get directions from someone, if you're trying to tell me how to get to your home, you're probably, if you told me the, the, from your perspective, it's not really going to be helpful to me because most of us, our home is kind of like the, the, the place at which we understand the world around us, right? If you're going to try to tell me how to get to your house, if someone were trying to give me directions to, to, uh, to, to Philadelphia, right? you would probably want to know where I'm standing. Because if I'm in New York, you're going to want to tell me to get on 95 South, right? But if I'm in Baltimore, you're going to want to tell me to get on 95 North to get to Philly. And, and at the end of the day, you got to know where your home base is before you take and, and get directions or before directions are helpful. And so we have to look at where is our home base? What, it is, what is it that we believe what is it that other people believe? And recognizing that we all have different perspectives. Like right now, my perspective is I'm looking at a bunch of beautiful, pretty people. Now, there are other people behind you who are seeing bad hair days and bald spots. That's all I'm saying, okay? So, so we have different perspectives. My view of you is different than the person sitting behind you's view of you, and, and we all see things different ways. Is that fair? Okay, so that's essentially what a worldview is. And here's the thing, it's as important for us to recognize that there is a right worldview and wrong worldviews, all right? There is one way to view the world, and it's what we call a biblical worldview. It's the way God designed us to view the world. And it's important to get it right. Let me show you in Romans 12 too. It reminds us, it says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I love what this verse points out. It says, listen, there's a lot of different ways to view the world. There's all sorts of different perspectives out there, but make sure that the way you view the world doesn't conform to the way everyone else views the world just because everyone else is viewing the world that way. Don't conform to other people's patterns, but instead make sure that your worldview is built on God. Let God transform you. Let God change the way you think and view the world. And then it goes on, right? And then you will learn. I like how this verse ends. It says, once you have a certain way that you view the world, then you're going to take certain actions. Then you're going to think about things. Then you're going to say certain things. The way you view the world really controls all of your thoughts and actions and words. You see how even that ends? It says, then you will learn to know what God's will is for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So in helping you understand about a worldview, another thing I want you to understand is that a worldview is really kind of, there's a recipe that makes up a worldview. And in your worldview, if you want to boil it down, there's six things that I would call control beliefs. And how you would answer your belief in these certain control beliefs make up a majority of the way you view the world and the people around you. So let me show you these six control beliefs. The first one is a question of God. What do you believe about God? Who, who, do you believe God exists? Do you believe God does not exist? Do you believe that there's, uh, you know, th th that there's multiple gods or no gods, that you are God? You know, what do you believe about God? That's a question that you have to answer to understand how you're going to interact with other people. Another control belief is that of reality. What is real and what isn't? Is, is the, the natural world anything you can test with science? Is that the only way to know what is real? Or is there something beyond the natural world and the supernatural? Is there a reality beyond this one? 
you have to answer that question, and everybody has an answer to that question. Another question is a question of knowledge. What is it that is knowable? And even better, what is true and what is false? And is truth absolute, or can something be true for you and not true for someone else? That's a question that everyone is going to have a view of, and your worldview is going to shape the way you interact with other people. How about this one? It's the question of human origin. All of us have a different perspective of where we think humans came from. How did everything come to be? Are, are, did, did, were, are we all just kind of a, a cosmic accident? Or was there a creator that created all things? Now, by the way, when I say that everybody has an answer for these questions, some people will answer this question with, I don't know. But recognize that I don't know is an answer to this question. Where do you think everything came from? I don't know. All right, well, that's your answer. It's going to change. The fact that you don't know the answer to that question is going to change the decisions you make in life. It's going to change the way you interact with people. Uh, Here's another one is, is a question of ethics. Another control belief is simply, how do you know what is right or wrong? What is your source of morality? Do you get to decide Is it just what's good for you is good for you? Or does society get to decide? Or is there some bigger, is there God that gets to decide what's right and wrong? Everyone has a perspective on how to answer this question. The the sixth one is, is the question of afterlife. What happens after you die? What happens when, uh, do the, do the lights just go out and you just turn to dust and, and time just keeps trucking along? Or is there something beyond this life for you? See, all of these questions are what we call control questions. The reason they're control questions, like I said, is they control how you live. They control how you interact with other people. They control the way you you view uh, the the people around you, the neighbors around you. I mean, let me give you a couple examples. Can you imagine, in the world we live in right now, you see suicide is through the roof. Murder, through the roof. Abortion, through the roof. Here's why. It's because when you change someone's view of the world and tell them that people are just a, an, a cosmic accident that weren't created with any real purpose or uh, intentionality, that, that what happens after you die is just the lights go out and nothing really happens and there is no moral. Whatever's right for you is right for, it does not necessarily right for me. And all, if all that is just, if that's how you answer those questions, It's going to change whether or not you view other people as valuable people created in the image of God. You see, a biblical worldview is going to provide a different outcome when you see people the way God intends you to see yourself and others. It's going to change the decisions you make, the words you use, the actions, and all all that. Another horrific example of this we see in our recent history of the Holocaust How can you allow, how can a a people group allow such an incredible just atrocity to happen? And what it is, is you got to change the way people view the world. You have to create within them a thought process where they no longer see life as valuable, where they no longer have the same uh, moral compass of what is right and wrong. You, you, what you do is you chip away at a biblical worldview until you can see a person as a, as a, a thing, You see, a worldview is incredibly important because it changes the way you live your life. Another illustration I love, and then we're going to move on from this definition of a worldview, but if you were going to build a new house, and if I was to ask you, what's the first step? Now, some of you would be like, well, I got to get drawings made. Okay. All right, so you got drawings made, and you got your permits done, and you got your land cleared, all that. All right, what is the first thing you're going to build when you build your new house? A foundation, right? You're going to pour the footers and fill it in, and you're going to have this, at some point you're going to walk up, and there's going to be concrete, brick, something. There's going to be a foundation on which you are going to build your your house. A a worldview is simply the foundation on which you build all of your other decisions in your life. See, once your foundation is laid, you're going to build your framework. You're going to 
That's where you get to decide how you're going to divvy things up and how much attention you're going to give to your family room versus your master bedroom. And that's where you get to do all those, how you're going to, all those decisions. The, the foundation is that worldview that each of us have. And we got to get it right. It's crucial that we get it right. And let me show you a, a passage of scripture that talks about the importance of getting the foundation right. In Colossians 2, it says this. It says, And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. So that's one way you could do it, right? You can say, I've committed my life to Christ, and now I want to build my life on the foundation of what he says is true. I want to grow my roots down on his truth so I can build up on a firm foundation. But there's another way. It says, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. You see, it is crucial for us to find and explore and examine this book to say, what does it say about the way I view the world? And to let it shape the way you view the world and to build your life on the truth of this book. Let me share some really hard facts with you. This research I did this week was kind of depressing, and now I'm going to pass that depression on to you. What I learned through a lot of different studies by Pew Research and Barna Group and others is that only 10% of professing Christians in this country actually hold a biblical worldview. Only 10% of the people in the United States of America that you interact with that say, I am a Christian, would actually agree with some of the core tenets of what makes a person a a follow a biblical worldview. And if you think that's, uh, if you think I'm picking on you, the same very recent research from 2022, Barna Research, I think they worked with Arizona Christian University, they found that only 37% of pastors in the United States of America hold a biblical worldview. By the way, that number was 51% 10 years ago. Two out of three born-again Christians struggle with the concept of absolute truth. 85% of our youth ascribe to what's called situational ethics, where when asked, these are professing Christians who are our children, when they're asked, can something be right for you and wrong for someone else? Can uh, situational ethics be a thing? And and 85% of our youth say, yeah, I think that's legit. Research also showed that only 5% of our professing high school-aged youth are biblically literate enough to understand the essentials of their faith. 5% in the United States, of our high school age students who claim to be followers of Christ actually are literate enough to be able to put to words the essentials of their faith. You know, in Scripture, there's a a parable that kind of highlights this unfortunate truth. You know, the parable of the soils? It says that as we go out and we share the good news, as we share the gospel, the seeds are going to land on four different types of soil. And of those four soils, only one of them does the seed land in a place that's committed to teaching and and fertilizing a place where those roots can grow deep on the foundation of what God says is real and good. And from that will be built up something good and true. But there's three other soils, right, where those seeds are being uh, not watered or not given the, the, the place to actually for roots to grow down. And there's a lot of people all over, not just amongst our students, okay, um, uh, everyone in this room. The truth is that many of us have just gotten really good at playing Christian. We know the right lines to say. Some of us, 
we, we only play Christian on Sundays. And you show up here for some reason, it's a box you're trying to check, it makes you feel good about yourself, you're making someone else happy by doing it. And, and as soon as you leave here, you go on about a, a worldview that is completely opposed to anything the Bible would, would suggest is true. Some of you, right, you're in the right circles, you know when to turn it on. Some of us were so good at playing the part, we play the part of a Christian just about everywhere we go, but we've never actually committed our lives to doing things God's way. And I don't know, I, I, my prayer as a pastor of this church is that these statistics wouldn't be true of us. That this would be a church where we understand the truth of God's word and we do whatever we can to make sure that the soil of this church is, is fertile and ready for gro- roots to grow deep and for people to be building a solid biblical worldview. And that we're weeding out the, the lies that try to sneak their way in. At the end of the day, though, listen, everyone in this room has a worldview. It's like a belly button, right? You might have an innie, you might have an Audi, you might have a Havsy belly button. My, my kids, they've labeled my belly button a black hole. <laughs> but here's the deal. We all have one, and we have to recognize that we have it, that we have to recognize that we have the way that we view the world and explore whether or not our worldview is one of those that is opposed to the biblical value system that we've been handed, or whether or not we're doing things God's way. And throughout this series, you know, today is kind of a foundational message. What we're going to explore over the next three weeks is really kind of asking those hard questions. What is it that we believe, and why do we believe it? Today, we're going to briefly look at some major world religions. I'm going to give you a few stats, but not not much. Next week, we're going to talk about uh, the atheistic worldviews, like nihilism and naturalism, those people who don't believe in any sort of existence of supernatural, and what kind of decisions that might come from those belief systems. Another thing we're going to look at is postmodernism on week three. On week four, if you really want to be challenged, Christians, listen, on week four, we're going to talk about a worldview called uh, moralistic therapeutic deism. I know that sounds really fancy, but when I say that only 10% of professing Christians actually hold a biblical worldview, if you're wondering what in the world do those other 90% actually believe, it's probably a moralistic therapeutic deism type worldview. It's got some, it's some hints of truth. But boy, is it off. In fact, many people probably in this room right now, week four will be really challenging for you. That's a good kind of challenge, right? The kind of kick and punch that we need to, to spur us into something better. So that's where we're going to go over the next four weeks. But here's why. You're like, why are we looking at other people's worldviews? Well, today we're going to look at a biblical worldview, but here's why. Asking questions about other worldviews helps solidify what it is that you believe. When you understand what other options are out there and how other people answer these questions, what it does is it makes you decide, well, I see there's like a few good options here that, that, that seem that other people seem to make sense of. What is it that I actually believe to be true? And you are forced to explore that. Let me show you um, some of the, the major religions of our world on, in a graph and try to explain a, this a little bit. So right now, in understanding the makeup, this is no longer just the United States. This is of the world, okay? This is of the world population. About 31% of the population of the world claims to be a, a professing, uh, they profess to be Christian. Now, nobody uh, quizzes them and makes them explain what that means. It's just a simple question. Which faith system do you align with? And 31% said Christian. Now, uh, for the sake of this study, uh, they put all, any faith system that kind of has Jesus at the center all within Christian. So within there, you have Protestant Christianity, you have Catholicism, you have uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, and everything is kind of in this 31%. So I kind of pulled out a little another piece of the pie to show you that within the Protestant Christianity, it's only about 12%. And unfortunately, based on those statistics I was sharing, only about 1% to 3% of the entire population of the world holds to a biblical worldview. That's something that should alarm us and sadden us. 
I also want to explore, though, this, this, these other major thought processes as far as uh, r- religion within our world. About 24% of our world is Muslim. Uh, we have about 16% that are unaffiliated. We're going to talk about that group next week. We call them the nuns. Not N-U-N-S, like Catholic nuns, but N-O-N-E-S. Those who have n- no or none, uh, they would check none on their affiliation with religion. Unaffiliated, about 15% Hindu throughout the world, about 7% Buddhist, and then you can see some other smaller percentages. The one that really surprised me was 0.2% Jewish. I would have imagined that would have been a bigger number. But as you explore those, what we would call, right, those uh, control beliefs, what is it that these faith systems believe now, one thing that's, that's floating out there right now, uh, a thought pattern, uh, a worldview that sounds something like this. Hey, you know, you go with your belief system. I'll go with my belief system. They're all just different roads that lead to the same place. And anyone who actually believes that, I'm just going to be blunt for a moment, is ignorant. Because even these belief systems will claim that they've got it right and everyone else has got it wrong. Within Christianity, we believe that the gospel is, is quite specific, that the only way to the Father is through Jesus Christ. That's what we believe and teach. I know it might sound very exclusive. It might be very offensive. You know, I, don't, I don't, listen, the gospel is quite offensive to those who don't want to believe it. But what is it that these other world religions believe as far as some of those control beliefs? I don't have time today to go through all of them, but I hope I'm whetting your appetite enough that maybe you'd spend some time this week to explore some of these questions further. You'd spend some time uh, looking at uh, what some of these other uh, world religions and, and that tend to be and you know, make this chart, what is they believe about some of these things? Uh, just about the question, remember one of the control beliefs is what do you believe about God. Well, looking at just even this, uh, the Muslim tradition, the 24% of our world, uh, they believe in a, a singular God as well, kind of, uh, kind of like, like we do. But while we believe in the one true God, they believe in uh, 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 their God called Allah. And, and within that understanding, uh, the, one major difference, okay, is within the Christian tradition, we have Jesus Christ. We have uh, understanding that we're now under this incredible covenant of grace. We're, we understand that we have a forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Well, within the Muslim tradition, th- there is none of that. There's, there's essentially, you're going to one day within this tradition be standing before what they believe is God and, 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 and accounting for whether they've done more good things or more bad things. In the Christian faith, you can see that our God is, our one true God is drastically different. It's quite a big difference. Within the Hindu and, and, and Buddhist traditions, one, uh, the Hindus believe in many gods. Buddhists believe in no god. Both are what we call pantheistic in that they believe that everything is essentially uh, supernatural. That we're all experiencing a supernatural experience right now. We're a bunch of energy and essentially what you see, touch, feel, smell is a bit of an illusion called maya. And that our ultimate goal is just to be kind of become one with each other and one with the universe. In fact, in in one tradition, I would say, in a way, both traditions kind of look at, uh, especially within Buddhism, that almost we make up, the universe makes up God. How about the question of reality? Again, I don't have time to go through all of these, but in the question of reality, I know in Hinduism and Buddhism, like I said, the pantheistic religions, they believe that that nothing is real, that everything is, is supernatural and a bit of an illusion. That's kind of interesting. Within the question of origin, within the Muslim tradition, they have an account of creation that's very similar to the Christian tradition. They believe in a six-day creation by God. Uh, There's a few differences uh, that are kind of significant. One, ours has on the seventh day God rested. Theirs, uh, God didn't need to rest. (laughs) Uh, God created everything from water in their tradition. In ours, God created everything out of the water. Uh, A few few small differences there. The question of ethics. You know, within the pantheism, like Buddhism and uh, uh, 
uh, Hinduism, there is no right or wrong. There is no good or evil. There's just enlightened ways of doing things and unenlightened ways of doing things. Within the theistic religions like Christianity and Judaism and uh, uh, Islam, they tend to agree that God makes the rules, that God gets to decide what's right and what's wrong. The question of afterlife, in the Islam tradition, Muslims believe that if you're good enough, you get to go to paradise, and if you're not good enough, you go to hell. So a literal uh, understanding of a heaven and a hell, but kind of a different rules for how to get there. In Judaism, modern day Jews would, would teach really that there is no hell, and heaven is a bit of a universalistic, universalistic open door policy that many different people will be able to get there. In Buddhism and Hinduism, they reject the idea of some sort of afterlife altogether because this is what is. You see, it's important to understand how other people believe and, and view the world. And while I could certainly go into detail with each one of these, could be its own message. We could spend time in growth courses going through world religions and what it is they believe and why they believe it. What I really want us to do before we leave this morning is have an understanding, a very brief understanding of what does the Bible say is real? What does the Bible say about God? What does the Bible say about our experience with knowledge and what is true and what isn't? What does the Bible say about the afterlife? What does a biblical worldview look like? And so briefly, as far as a biblical worldview is concerned, I want to show you a couple things. I want to answer those six control beliefs. Uh, again, each one of these could be its own message, but for the sake of time, I'm going to share uh, one passage of Scripture for each, even though I could share 20 passages of Scripture for each. But the question of God, and let's look at God first. See, we believe in one sovereign God, the creator of all things, who is perfect in every way. See, God exists eternally in three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Through his divine power, God continues to sustain his creation to fulfill his redemptive purposes. That's what we believe the Bible teaches about God and who he is. In fact, let me show you this in Scripture. In 1 Peter 1, 2, it shows us all kind of the persons of, of, of God. It says, God the Father knew you and chose you long ago. And his spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, we see within this one passage of scripture the truth about who God is, that God exists as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And they've existed long ago and will exist forever into eternity in the person and the work of each one of, of those parts. How about the question of reality? Question of reality. You see, we believe that there is a natural world consisting of time, matter, and space. But we also, as Christians, based on our understanding of God's word, believe that there is a supernatural world that really exists outside of those scientific boundaries. Certainly, we can use science to test the natural world, but to just discount the supernatural world because science can't prove it, that might be someone else's view of the world, but it's not our biblical worldview. See, in 2 Corinthians 4.18, it says, So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. I love how God's word makes it really clear that those of us who trust in a biblical worldview, we recognize that there's both a natural world and a supernatural world, and both are part of our reality how about the question of knowledge? You see, in a Christian worldview, we believe that truth is absolute and that God is the source of what is true and what is not. You are not the source. Society is not the source. Your feelings are not the source. God is the source. 
Proverbs 2 says it this way, my child, listen to what I say my tre- and treasure my commands. Tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Search for them as you would silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. Then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord and you will gain the knowledge of God. If you want to understand what is real and what is wise and what is good, a biblical worldview shows us that God is the source of that. How about the question of origin? Do we believe that God's word teaches that he is the creator of all things and that humans were uniquely created in the image of God? You can imagine how this is going to change the way you treat other people. If you interact with someone and you don't really care for them all that much, and you're willing to recognize that they were uniquely created in the image of God, it's going to change the way you care about other people. Here's what the Bible says about origin. It says, God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. Everything that exists in a biblical worldview, we recognize that God had a hand in creating it. How about the question of ethics? Simply put, the way I wrote it, is that since God made the game, he gets to set the rules. God decides what is good and what is bad. 2 Timothy says it this way in verse, chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God. So this book, the worldview on which Uh, the, The book on which we're building our worldview, it says all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip people to do every good work. See, this book knows what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's evil. And every word of it has been designed to help us shape our lives around that. How about the question of afterlife? See, after death in the natural world, all people continue to exist in a real place called heaven and hell. That's what we believe the Bible teaches. In fact, Matthew 25 says it this way, and those who refuse me will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. Then it goes on and throughout the gospel to explain none of us is righteous but that through Jesus Christ, we can be made righteous through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You and I can be counted as righteous and experience an eternal existence in the afterlife. See, the Bible answers these questions. There's 20 verses about each of these questions, 50, 100 verses about each of these questions. We can dig into it and say, what does the Bible say about reality? What does the Bible say about knowledge? What does the Bible say about the afterlife? What does the Bible say about God? And we can explore that and learn it and shape our lives around it. So essentially where we end up is that question of what now, God? God, what do you want us to do with this understanding? I want to challenge you with something. Most of us, we start with a worldview that we borrowed from our parents. The way you view the world is likely, up until a certain age, the way your parents view the world. Their politics were probably the same as your politics. Their favorite baseball team was probably your favorite baseball team. Your parents have this incredible ability to kind of, kind of you, you get to borrow that worldview from them. But at some point, you get to an age where you recognize, I have to decide what I believe because I want it to be my worldview. For me, that happened in high school. When my mom passed away, I quickly learned that she was the spiritual foundation of my family. She was the one who made sure we were in church. And when my dad just kind of dropped the ball in that way, I had to decide, do I want to get in my car and drive myself to be part of a community of faith? Do I want to spend time in God's word on my own? I had to claim my faith as my own and establish my own foundation on which to build my house. And here's what I can do. I can tell you What I believe this book teaches is a solid biblical foundation, but I can't force you to build your house on it. You have to decide where you're going to build your house. You get to build it on that foundation or on something else. I can't can't make that decision for you, but I can tell you this. You are never going to find freedom outside of a biblical worldview. You are never going to find freedom in your life purpose in your life, joy in your life, 
outside of a biblical worldview. And I hope you carry that thought into this series. We had a baptism this morning, right, during your service. It's not too late. We'll baptize you next service. If you're saying right now, I've had some other worldview. I have my foundation. My house has been built somewhere else and it's crumbling because the foundation is useless. And say, I want to have a solid biblical foundation. I want to give my life to Jesus today and start shaping my life around his word and his revelation. Today could be the day you give your life to Jesus. Next service, we could baptize you. You could take that initial step of obedience in baptism. We have everything you need, shirts, towels, flip-flops, whatever it is. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you for being good. Thank you for having a a solid uh, revelation to us, a solid foundation on which we can build our, our perspective of this world. Father, I pray that you would continue to reveal truth to us. We recognize what that solid foundation looks like. And God, now help us as a church to build up that framework, to build up our homes on top of that and to become more and more like your son. If there's anyone in this room right now that needs to start and and kind of rebuild on the firm foundation of you, that today would be the day they decide that. They would tell someone about that decision so we can walk with them and help them build their new home. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.